Podcast. Presented by XFL2K.com. With your host, Tron Hawkins. Well, welcome to This Is XFL Podcast. I'm your host, Tron Hawkins. Um, before I get started this episode, I just want to say go check out um, our Discord, XFL2K's Discord. Uh, go check out XFL2K.com. Go check out XFL Board. Check out all those places where you can connect with real XFL fans and real football fans. These ain't the fans that ran down the AAF. Those are not real XFL fans. These are the people who love football. And people that love football know about these two coaches I'm going to talk about today. They, these hires, you know, they're not as sexy as the other ones that we've gotten so far in the XFL, but these are for football fans. Real football fans know who these guys are. And I know on the surface, they kind of would seem like a disappointment, but if you go back and listen to what they said in the press conferences, you see that these coaches want to coach. These coaches want to be a part of this. And, you know, a lot of people was kind of disappointed that Scott Linehan wasn't the coach for the St. Louis team, but Jonathan Hayes is. Scott Linehan's interview supposedly fell apart, and he, it was awful. He didn't want to be here. And Jonathan Hayes does. Kevin Gilbride does. So I think that's important to, you know, think about when you think about these hiring of coaches. Who do they interview and who actually wanted to be here and who got it? And these two coaches, from what I heard, they got it. So let's talk about them. So Kil- Gilbride was the famously known as offensive coordinator – for the two Giants teams that beat the Patriots. Thank you, God. Um, the way I look at it, um, if he can make Eli Manning a Super Bowl winning quarterback, not once but twice, I mean, he pretty much made Eli Manning a Hall of Famer. Think about that. Eli Manning ended up winning the same amount of Super Bowls as his better, 100 times better brother because of Kevin Gilbride's play calling. So let's go through Gilbride's career first. Then I'll talk about Hayes. You know, Hayes' career is not as um, obviously in depth. But I kind of tell you what I thought about him um, from what I heard. Again, He's not known to a lot of just outside people, but he is known to the football world, and it seems like a good hire. So, again, two coaches have been named this week. That's why I kind of waited um, to record this episode to have both on one episode because um, I don't want to bombard you with too many <laughs> episodes, obviously. That's why I did a – that's why I did a um, – in case you missed the episode. But, yeah, let's talk about Gilbride first. So he started um, his coaching career – I'm um, actually, he attended uh, South Connecticut State University where he played quarterback and tight end and earned a degree in physical education. He then went to Idaho State University where he earned a master's degree in athletic administration. Um, Gilbride's coaching career began actually in 1974. He's, I think he is the oldest coach um, so far in the XFL. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I might be wrong, but he was a graduate assistant there where he served as linebacker coach for the 1974 season. Gilbride was also the co-head coach for the Idaho State women's basketball team in their inaugural year. So he's got experience coaching. I mean, he's been coaching for a long time. Again, he's got the most experience of anybody. He might not have a whole lot of head coaching experience when I get into, but he has coaching experience. He also coached at Tufts University. Um, he joined them prior to the 1976 season as linebacker coach. He held that position with two um for two seasons following the 1977 season, he joined American Inter- International College. Um, he was only there from 78 to 79. He would later coach at his alma mater for five seasons, um, South Connecticut State, from 80 to 84, where he compiled a 35-14-2 and record. Um, he was also a passing game coordinator for the ECU Pirates. Um, Gilbride spent his first year overseeing the passing game in sort of like a quarterback's coach position. Again, he's not the first coach. Um, in this new XFL that has quarterback experience. I keep talking about it in all the other coaches' uh, episodes. Quarterbacks can be the most important position in this league, and you can tell by the coaches that they're hiring that they want it to be like that. They want the coaches to hop up the quarterbacks. Because the quarterbacks can be the highest paid person on the team, and they can be the most important person on the team. He was offensive coordinator for the CU Pilots from 88. They finished 3-8. Um, he was hired by the Houston Oilers as a quarterback coach and made the jump to the National Football League. Gilbride served as assistant coach for the Ottawa Rough Riders in 1985. That's being, the team finished 79 but made the playoffs where they lost in the Eastern Semifinals to Montreal. The next season, they were 3-10 th- and, and failed to qualify in the postseason. <clears throat> From 89 to 2014, Gilbride served as assistant coordinator with a number of NFL franchises, working as quarterback coach and office coordinator. <laughs> Um, he began his career, as I said, with the Oilers. In the first season, quarterback Warren Moon passed for 3,600 yards and 23 touchdowns against 14 picks. 
Um, following the solid year by Moon, the Oilers named Gilbride offense coordinator for the 90s season. During his time with the Oilers, Gilbride ran a variation of the run-and-shoot offense. The team finished top five in scoring each year with Gilbride as offense coordinator. And this is 90-94, 2 This is back before the league became a passing league. Think about the talent he had there. I mean, he had Moon. I mean, he was, Moon was one of the most underrated quarterbacks in the history of football, Canadian Football League, and NFL. Um, so, if you think about it, he was he's way ahead of his time, and you're going to have to be way ahead of the time in this league. You're going to have to think outside the box. And he's shown he could do that almost 30 years ago. So, I mean, he's a good coach. I think he's perfect for this New York franchise. The 92 season saw Houston finished 10 and 6, second place by Steelers. Gilbride's offense scored 350 points, good for six in the league. In the classic 1992 ASC wildcard game, the Bills dubbed uh, against the Buffalo Bills, dubbed the comeback by Bills fans. Oilers was like 23 to 8 at halftime, but the Bills scored 38 unanswered. Gilbride actually had kidney cancer after that season, but of course he survived. Um, Gilbride, uh, Gilbride said his experience with the punch in Houston on a football life, Houston 93. Through all the things you've been fortunate to be a part of, that you're proud of, this is the last thing you want to be considered, you know, attached to the rest of your life. But uh, it happens. Yeah, and the 94 team finished 2 and 14, last last ranked uh, offensive league. So he didn't want to be a part of that. But that's what he was attached to. And after that, they went to um, Tennessee, became the Titans. So, for the inaugural season, 95, the Jaguars hired Tom Coughlin as his head coach and Gil Bright as offensive coordinator. That's when they first linked up. The team finished 4 and, uh, finished four and 12, scoring just 275 points, 27th in the league. The following year, they went 9-7, and seven, scoring 325 points, 14th in the league, but second in yards. The Jaguars treated the Bills in the wildcard game, and then the Broncos in the upset by the same score that they beat the Bills by, 30-27. They lost New England place in the AFC title game, 26 Following the season, Gilbride was hired by the San Diego Chargers. Um, this is when they drafted um, Ryan Leaf. So you kind of know how that goes. I'm going to get into that. In 99 to 2000, he was offensive coordinator for the Steelers. The team scored 17 points, but finished 6 and 10. Um, the team improved the next season, 9 and 7, but they was in the middle of the pack, and he was fired um, offense. Um, he was NFL uh, analyst for ESPN from, in 2001. Um, following that, um, he was office coordinator for the Bills. Um, they finished eight and eight, scoring 379 points, but set seven team record, uh, seven team records. The following year, they finished six and ten, thirtieth in the league in total points. Um, Gil Brad led the team. Um, they go be with the Giants uh, on January 26, 2004. He was quarterback coach for Coughlin in 2004. Um, he worked with Eli Manning in that position for three years, which Manning, after replacing Kurt Warner, led Giants to a 1-6 record, uh, leading the team overall to a 6-10 and record. Um, they went 11-5 in 2005, catching only the first playoff berth since 2002, but the first division title since 2000. Uh, they were turning to the playoff in 2006, um, no, yeah, but was ousted in the first round by the Philadelphia Eagles. Following that season, the Giants announced the entire coaching staff would return on one-year contracts, and that one year is when... They beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl, um, 17-14, and one of the best games ever seen. Um, under Gilbride, the Giants had four years where their offense has scored 400 or more points. Um, 2008, the Giants finished with 12-4 record, but was outside the first round by um, the Eagles in the first round. Gilbride's offense scored 427 points, third in the NFL. Um, in 2008, the Oakland Raiders received permission to interview Gilbride for their vacant head coaching position. But the job ended up going to Tom Cable. The following year, the Giants failed to eight and eight, but yet still scored twenty two points, good for eighth in the league and fourth total in fourth highest total in team history. This guy can put up some points, and in this league is going to be nothing but points. Um, so if you think about it, he knows what to do in this league. You don't think he's going to go for three point conversions after he scores a touchdown? I mean, he's going to go for it. He's going to put up as many points as possible because he's done it. He's done it with teams that was led by Eli Manning. So think about what he's going to do with a, you know, with a team of hungry young guys that want to make a name for themselves in this league. 2010, um, let me see, I'm sorry, 2011, um, they ended up going back to the Super Bowl, uh, once again facing the uh, Patriots, and they had, uh, like they had four years before, they f- defeated the Patriots 21-17 to capture their fourth title. For the season, they finished ninth league in offensive scoring with 394 points while allowing 400. Gilbride earned his second Super Bowl ring. 
from the 2012 season, the Giants finished nine and seven again, but missed playoffs. They scored 429 points, though. Again, six in the league, so they're missing the playoffs. But it ain't because of their offense. I mean, they're putting up constantly around 400 points. Um, and for the 2012, I'm sorry. Um, they missed playoffs despite starting six and four and going three and three after the bye week. 2013, the Giants began zero and six, causing many people to question go by reach of the team. Um, the team rebounded, however, and won seven of the final ten games. Despite his two Super Bowl wins with the team, fans are growing impatient with the offense. Um, at the end of the season, John Mara said, I think our offense is broken right now. We need to fix that. On January 12, 2014, Gilbride announced he would retire. But five years later, um, here he is. He is in the XFL, um, back in his home stomping grounds, back in the stadium where he did some good work at MetLife, and he's here. So, um, his record as a head coach is only 6 and 16. But as an offensive coordinator, he's won Super Bowls. He's went in there and put up points after points after points. And when you think about it, they scored so many points, broke records. They broke, um, they broke record after record. They always finished in the top 10. That shows you that the losing record is not the offense, it was the defense doing it. Even with. You know, the guys they had on that defense, they still was losing games because of the defense. Because he's putting up points after points after points. And I think he's a very underrated offensive coordinator. <clears throat> Oliver Luck said, Vincent McMahon and I are thrilled that Kevin Gilbrown has joined us and will guide the XFL team in New York. Kevin has 40 years of experience as a football coach at the college and pro level, including 10 years in New York with the Giants. So he's uniquely qualified to work in this market and knows the heartbeat of the local football fan. He's an offensive-minded coach and understands the quickest style of play. Um, we want to be the hallmark of the XFL come February. Again, these coaches do have local affiliation. Now, Jonathan Hayes don't, but he does. Again, he knows what these people want. He knows that um, New York is not the easiest place to work in. And he knows that because he's dealt with the fans before. But that means he can do it again. That means he is built for it. Um, I think he's a great hire. I think on the surface it might have not seemed that way. Um, but he is. I, I think, you know, after you get go, eh, Kevin Gilbride, that's kind of boring. But it really isn't. If you take a deep dive and realize what he was doing in the 90s and in the 2000s, you're like, okay, this actually makes more sense um, than I thought it would, and I think it's a great hire for New York. So now we're going to talk about the new St. Louis coach, Jonathan Hayes. Now, a lot of information I get uh, on these coaches, I ain't going to lie, is off Wikipedia, which has always been my go-to source ever since I was in middle school. Um, well, actually, high school, a little older. But on Jonathan Hayes' page, it just says he played for the Kansas City Chiefs from 85 to 93, the Steelers from 94 to 96, and he's currently the tight ends coach, or he was for the Cincinnati Bengals, and held that position since 2003. Then it said in January 2018, Hayes was named the head coach of the East team in the East-West Swat and Shrine game. And it said on April 18, 2019, he was announced as the St. Louis franchise coach for the revived XFL. That is literally all it says. See, so I went to um, the XFL.com, and I've seen this. Oliver Luck said, It's an honor to provide John an opportunity to be the head coach for the first time after 37 years as a player and assistant coach in the NFL and at the college level. Jonathan comes with an offensive perspective that should help him thrive as we reimagine the game and engineer a style of play that's fast and brisk. We are excited to welcome him to the XFL family. Hey, he said, It's a privilege to have the opportunity to be the head coach and general manager of the XFL team in St. Louis. I spent most of my NFL playing career in Missouri. So even though it might not look like it on the surface, it makes sense. His hiring makes sense just like everybody else did. He does have some local affiliation. Not about him not being with St. Louis. He was with Kansas City, Missouri. But it makes sense. <clears throat> so Hazel named the Bengals offensive, uh, I'm sorry, tight end coach in 2003. And works alongside uh, Marvin Lewis to the completion of the 2018 season. Before coaching in the NFL, he served a tight end coach and special teams coordinator at Oklahoma under fellow XFL coach Bob Stoops. So that's going to be a good little rivalry um, out there. As NFL player, Hayes was Kansas City's second-round pick in 1985 out of the University of Iowa. He spent nine seasons at the Chiefs, um, with the Chiefs before finishing his career with the Steelers. Hayes played in 184 NFL games with 153 career receptions for 1,718 yards and 13 touchdowns. Again, this back before tight ends became what they are now. Back then, they just blocked. Um, so to have that many yards and touchdowns in that day, this is a pretty big deal. Again, he's not the top tight end of all time. 
but he knows enough. <laughs> Trust me, he had plenty of experience as tight end. In college, Hayes played tight end and linebacker for the University of Iowa, where he was a team captain, earned first team All American honors as a senior. He holds a bachelor's degree in general studies from Iowa. So, again, there's not really much to talk about here. This is an assistant coach finally getting his first chance, and I like it. I know it's on service, a lot of St. Louis fans kind of like who and why, and it's kind of a disappointment. But this guy wants to be in St. Louis, and this guy gets it. As you can tell by when you listen to the press conference, he wants this team to be part of the community. He gets what the mission statement is. It ain't just about the game. It's about the community, and he wants to make St. Louis better with the XFL team. He knows that they lost the team, and he wants to bring back a respectable team to this city. After everything St. Louis has been through, I think he's the perfect coach. He gets it. He knows St. Louis, kind of, but he knows what it's like. Um, he knows the atmosphere there. He said he felt welcome there. He felt comfortable. Again, they might have interviewed Scott Linehan, but he, he obviously tanked it or something for Jonathan Hayes to get it. He wanted the job. He wanted to be here. And I'm sure everybody in St. Louis wants a coach that wants to be there that gets it. He gets it. He gets it. He gets it. He understands what they have to do to make this league succeed. He knows what he's going to have to do on offense. Again, he might not have been an offensive coordinator or head coach, but he's been an offensive player and an offensive skill position coach. He's been around some great minds. He's going to do fine. And honestly, I like him a whole lot better than I thought I would. Now, when I rank the coaches after all eight are named, I don't know where I'm going to put them. Just on experience alone, I might have to put them eighth. That don't mean I don't like them. He's going to grow on you. He's going to grow on St. Louis. He's going to grow on our XFL fans. And I think at the end of the day, he's going to be probably the most well-respected coach. And think about this. If he does good in St. Louis, then the XFL, who says that the NFL won't come knocking one day and give him a chance on a bigger stage? I, I know this ain't a developmental league for players, maybe not even for coaches. But for somebody like this that's been around that long and this is his first coaching stint, he deserves it. And if this means later on he gets to coach at the NFL level, then so be it. We'll be proud of him. Thank you for listening to this episode. Um, it's probably a little bit shorter. There's not a whole lot going on with these coaches. You know, this ain't a Bob Stoops or, um, you know, even a Pep Hamilton. Um, but these are two great coaches. I think they're going to make the XFL proud. And we're getting closer and closer um, to 2020. There's only two coaches left, Houston and L.A. Um, like XFL 2K said, I think L.A. is going to be where they announced the TV deal. I'm pretty sure it's Fox, 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 Horn, ESPN, ABC. Um, it would make sense. And I know I'm excited. I get to watch every single game and get to recap it for y'all, the fans. Again, hit me up on Twitter at XFL Podcast. Hit me up on Facebook at XFL Podcast. Um, join our Discord in XFL 2K where we talk about everything but mainly XFL. Check out XFL Board. Um, get to talk to fellow XFL fans. There are a lot out there. Um, you know how I know there's a lot of XFL fans out there? After the press conference Thursday or yesterday, um, Jonathan Hayes was trending worldwide. The man who never had a coaching job was trending worldwide, thanks to us, the XFL fans and the community. And again, welcome to the AAF fans. Uh, we're welcoming you at open arms. Um, you know, everybody loves football. This is a football league. We are football people. That's why I make this podcast. That's why we should respect these coaches and respect other football fans, no matter what league we like. Thank you and have a good night.